Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the parts of the old law which remain valid and grave today, the Ten Commandments. So far, we've talked about the first four commandments, and now it's time to tackle the fifth, Thou shalt not kill. We've begun talking about whether particular actions can be considered murder, and now it's time to discuss abortion. Is it murder? Many people would like us to believe that abortion is not murder, and they've advanced several arguments in favor of their position. Some of these arguments are directly relevant to the question of whether or not abortion is murder, while others are not directly relevant. For this reason, we'll be tackling the relevant arguments first and dealing with the others afterwards, if we have enough time. Also, please note that some of these arguments are rather old chestnuts, but as they're still bandied around in certain circles, I think it's best to address them. In order to answer this question, we need to begin by addressing what the unborn is. If it's a living, unique, individual human being, then abortion is murder. If they're not living, not unique, not individual, or not a human being, then abortion is not murder, and arguments have been advanced raising issue with each of these points. Issue number one, living. First, there are some people who say that the unborn isn't really alive at certain early stages. I really don't know why they say this. The earliest stage of the unborn is known as a zygote, a single cell formed when the male sperm fertilizes the female ovum. However, this isn't a dead cell. The zygote is clearly a living cell, and we know this because it later divides, absorbs nutrients, and grows to become larger and more complex. I don't think anyone would claim that the human sperm or the human ovum aren't alive. I also don't know any biologist who'd claim that the human zygote isn't alive, and it certainly doesn't stop being alive at any point during its natural prenatal development. They can, of course, die before birth, but that's not part of the normal course of events by any means. Therefore, the unborn is living. Issue number two, unique. At almost the very moment when the sperm and ovum connect and the zygote begins to form, they have a unique pattern of DNA composed of the building blocks derived from the mother and father. The zygote keeps this same pattern of DNA as it grows into a blastocyst, develops into an embryo, and then a fetus, and after it's born, until after its death. Therefore, the uniqueness of the human's DNA fingerprint is present from the first moment the zygote forms. Therefore, the unborn is unique. Issue number three, individual. The arguments generally advanced against the unborn being an individual tend to center around the viability of life outside the womb, how capable it is of surviving unaided. However, I haven't found any arguments for this that are consistent. To explain what I mean, let me show you a few of the ones I did find. Some claim that the unborn isn't an individual because they can't survive unaided. However, a person in a coma also can't survive unaided, and we consider them individuals. In fact, I'd argue that no one can survive completely unaided. Human beings need to cooperate with each other in order to have the necessities of life. Somebody needs to grow food. Somebody needs to make clothes. Somebody needs to build homes, and so on. No single person can do all of this for themselves. Therefore, this isn't a good argument. Some claim that the unborn isn't an individual because they're inside the body of the mother and depending on her for nutrients. However, all of this also applies to a tapeworm, and we don't consider a tapeworm to be part of the body of its host. It's a separate organism. Therefore, this isn't a good argument. Some claim that the unborn isn't an individual because it's not fully developed, but as we said in reference to the last point, the unborn is unique and distinct from the mother in every way, biologically, that matters. Therefore, this isn't a good argument. Therefore, the unborn is an individual. Issue number four, human being. This might be the easiest one of all. In order to prove that the unborn is human, we only need to establish that he or she descends from a human being. Why? Because of biogenesis. In science, the principle of biogenesis, usually attributed to Louis Pasteur, is the following. All life is from life. This means that life forms reproduce after their own kind, as we discovered in episode 12. Foxes make baby foxes, chickens make chickens, trees make trees, etc. If the unborn weren't human, it would violate this principle, because you would have an instance of a human being giving birth to something which is not human, but later becomes human. This is clearly a violation of the principle of biogenesis. Therefore, the unborn is human. Is abortion murder? Premise 1. Abortion is murder if the unborn is a living, unique, individual human being. Premise 2. 
The unborn is a living, unique, individual human being. Conclusion. Therefore, abortion is murder. Now, because it's murder, the act violates the fifth commandment and is evil by its nature, and therefore may never be done for any reason. Nevertheless, I'm going to take a moment to look at some of the other arguments advanced by the culture in favor of abortion and see if we can cut through a misunderstanding or two. Argument 1. We should support the right to choose. Response. Whether we support it or not, people do have the ability to make their own choices, so that's not really the issue. The issue is, what's being chosen? Should I support a husband in his choice to commit adultery? Should I support a serial killer in his choice to blow up an office building? Clearly, the answer is no. We're only justified in supporting choices that are morally good. Argument 2. Women should be able to do whatever they want with their bodies. Response. No, they shouldn't. No one should. We should be prevented from using our bodies to harm others and do evil. For example, if I decide to use my body to whack someone's head off with a machete, that's an evil choice, and I should be prevented from making it. In the same way, using our bodies to execute the unborn should also be prevented. Argument 3. If we didn't have abortion enshrined in law, it would be a dangerous back-alley procedure. Response. If we don't have bank robbery enshrined in law, it would be dangerous to rob a bank. The fact is, we want it to be dangerous to do evil, because that way, people will be less likely to choose that evil action. Argument 4. Only women may comment on the abortion issue. Response. I guess the assumption is that only women can commit this crime, so only women should be allowed to raise issue with it. If so, that's false. Most abortions are performed by male abortionists. However, the real issue here is with whether discussion of issues of ethics can or should be confined to a single gender, and they simply shouldn't. There's just no reason why one gender should be allowed to discuss all dimensions of ethics and the other one barred from certain discussions. In any case, though, no one really believes this argument anyway, because people who use this argument will be just as dissatisfied when women publicly oppose abortion and won't raise issue with it when male politicians and businessmen get up in front of a crowd of people and try to defend abortion. Argument 5. In cases of rape or incest, abortion should be allowed. Response. Well, firstly, cases of rape or incest represent a microscopic fraction of the number of abortions had on U.S. soil and around the world. However, more importantly, no. No, it should not be allowed in those cases. Remember your ethics. We may not do evil so that good might come of it, and we certainly may not do evil to an innocent person because we ourselves are the victims of evil. It's not the unborn, but the father who should be punished in cases of rape and incest. Argument 6. I'm personally opposed to abortion, but I don't want to force my beliefs on others. Response. There is no such thing as being personally opposed to something. You can personally dislike something and personally prefer something else, but in order to oppose something, you must actually oppose it, even when that means that others see you as trying to force your beliefs on them. If the person who makes this claim means oppose when they say oppose, then they are not really opposing abortion when they claim to. If they mean dislike instead, then they might be being fairly honest about that, but so what? Liking or disliking something is not a moral issue, and I don't see why it should matter. So, in conclusion, abortion is murder, and none of the arguments in favor of it, either relevant or irrelevant to that, succeed in undermining that fact. Next time, what about killing people in a war? Is that murder? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.